For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling place. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. I will abundantly bless her provisions. I will satisfy her poor with bread. Her priests I will clothe with salvation, and her saints will shout for joy. There I will make a horn to sprout for David. I have prepared a lamp for my anointed. His enemies I will clothe with shame, but on him his crown will shine. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Come, bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who stand by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands to the holy place and bless the Lord. May the Lord bless you from Zion, he who made heaven and earth. Awesome. Good morning, everybody. How are you doing today? Good to see you guys. I can't see those in the back because uh, you're hiding out in the back because you're scared of what God's going to do in your life if you came a little closer. So that'd be a lesson to you. Man, I'm excited to be here. We love Joy Church Medford. So for those of you that don't know me, I'm Jake, and uh, I am Pastor Steve and Kim's oldest son and uh, best son and um, (laughs) most humble And uh, no, I'm just kidding. Just love you guys so much. And Bethany and I are the lead pastors of Joy Church in Eugene. And uh, so we're family for for so many more reasons than just being schmelzers. We're family. We're part of the Joy Church family. How many of you are excited about being part of Joy Church? I heard about the series that you're doing about uh, a playlist for life, talking about the Psalms or the songs of ascent that the pilgrims on their way to Jerusalem would sing. And The Psalms that we're going through today, 132 through 134, are the songs of blessing. So today we're going to talk about blessing, but I need your help. Uh, I like to be interactive, and I get bored if other people aren't doing things at the same time. I kind of have OCD, and I just want to, I want more engagement and activity. So if you could help me out today, uh, we're going to, we're going to do this thing where we basically do a call and response. So this is participatory, right? You got to participate. So I'm going to say this. I learned this a couple years ago. Uh, I'm going to say, somebody's going to get blessed. And then you're going to say, might as well be me. All right? Are you ready? So somebody's going to get blessed. Might as well be me. Let's try it again. Somebody's going to get blessed. Might as well be me. Awesome. You're, you got it. You're right there. So we're talking about blessing today. How many of you like to be blessed? Right? And we all like to be blessed, right? And I want to share some thoughts about blessing, but I want to start by saying blessing is different than earning an effort. Because you don't earn blessing, you receive blessing. Right? Blessing is not something that you achieve. Blessing is not something that you, you work really hard, you strive for. Blessing is something that is given to you because someone loves you or likes you a lot. Come on. And God wants to bless you in your life. Now, a lot of people, they hear about God, and they hear about God's love, and they, we've all heard, you know, Christian songs on the radio, and we've all been sitting on a toilet in some Christian's house and read a Precious Moments thing on the wall, and we're like, where's the Reader's Digest? I'm so bored to death. And we read things about God's love, and it's always like, ah, God's love. And we all believe God loves us. How many of you believe God loves you? But did you know that God actually likes you? Because how many times do we think, well, he loves me. He has to love me. It's his job. Right? It says so in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Right? And we believe he loves us, but then we kind of don't think he likes us. And so we tend to think of God's blessing that he wants to give us as sort of an attribute of what he has to do because he loves us. And if we earn it and if we're good and we behave and we do all the right stuff and if we work hard, then we'll earn his blessings. But that's not what blessings are. Blessings are given. Blessings are received. They're not earned. Blessing is the tangible reality of God's goodness and favor in your life. Like my kids, they definitely have not earned their Christmas presents this year. They have earned coal, you know, potatoes. What do you put in naughty kids' stockings right now? Grandma doesn't agree. She thinks they've earned some blessing, and, and they have. But they're, my kids don't earn Christmas presents. They receive them because they are blessed because of my love as their father. Uh, I, I definitely have not earned any Christmas presents this year, but my mom, she demands to bless me. She, she sends out a note, usually late August, 
Hey, family. <laughs> Hope, remember to put on sunscreen. Oh, by the way, uh, where's your Christmas list, right? Because mom is going to bless. My dad's trying to figure out how to get this to stop happening, but she's going to do it no matter what because her goodness and favor on our lives. Now, and, and, and so recently she said, Jake, what's your Christmas list? I said, mom, I'm a 35-year-old man. You don't have to buy me presents. She said, I'm going to buy you something anyways, so you might as well tell me what you want. Pretty much exact quote, right? And, uh, I, and so my mom, I have not earned these presents, but my mom demands to bless me. They're going to come. But here's the thing about these presents, that there's something, uh, though I don't earn them, though I, have not, I don't achieve them, I have to be in the right position to receive them. And so we actually have to come, which is sort of probably part of the goal too, and come to Medford and be there on Christmas Day at mom and dad's house next to the Christmas tree so that we can receive the blessing. Come on, somebody. And so blessing, though it's not a matter of achieving or earning or effort, it is a matter of positioning. And so today I want to teach you how to be positioned for blessing, how to put your life in front of the train of God's goodness. You ever seen that thing on, they show people uh, driving around those, the blocks on the railroad and then getting hit by a train? That's not good. What is good, though, is positioning your life and letting the train of God's blessing crash into it. God, God loves you and he likes you. He wants to bless you. So how do we position our life, get ourselves in place for God's blessing? Here's the thing. We know this in life. It's not what you know. It's who you know, right? And there's something about being in the right place at the right time. Any of you guys ever hung out with Robert Souza at a church picnic? Yeah. Though he is demon-possessed and likes the L.A. Dodgers, Because I am a Christian, I stand next to him and try to let my Jesus mojo of loving the San Francisco Giants God's team rub off on him. Uh, but Robert, though he is a sinner, there is grace. Come on, in Jesus' name. But if you're standing next to Robert, Robert's the man because he'll say, Hey, bro, I got something for you. And it's linguista sausage. Come on, the glory of God. And I don't know how he does it, but he, Robert, you have a gift. He does the linguisa, and he does just a tiny bit of mustard on the bun, and it really rocks. Come on. And I'm just seeding that in there for the next time I'm near you. <laughs> and I didn't earn it, and I didn't, I didn't do anything to achieve it. I don't even like the same baseball team as him, but he still brings the blessing, because it's not what you know, it's who you know. Come on. Getting yourself in the right place at the right time. And this is how it works with God. And this is what the songs of ascent that we've been going through over the last few weeks, what the, these psalms are all about. These psalms that are written in the, these, ancient, these ancient songs that were sung by pilgrims on their way up to Jerusalem and Israel, they understood something that it wasn't about effort or earning. It was about getting yourself in the place that God chose to bless. And at this time and place, God chose to bless the city of Jerusalem. This was the place where his presence and his goodness and his favor was. It was where the king dwelt. It's where law and order and justice uh, came from. It was the place that God said, get here. This is where I want to bless you. And that's what these songs are about. The songs that were quoted in that video that we just watched. And I'm going to read them to you today. Uh, songs of Ascent. Psalm 132 verse 13 says, For the Lord has chosen Jerusalem. He has desired it for his home. This is my resting place forever, he said. I will live here, for this is the home I desired. I will bless this city. Somebody say, uh, somebody's going to get blessed? Might as well be me. Sorry, I tried to give you my part, but I had to take it. I will bless this city and make it prosperous. I will satisfy its poor with food. I will clothe its priests with godliness. Its faithful servants will sing for joy. And he goes on. He says, I've chosen this place. This is a, a position of blessing, a place of blessing. In, in Psalms 133, it talks about harmony and unity. It says, harmony is as refreshing as the dew from Mount Hermon that falls on the mountains of Zion. And there the Lord has pronounced his blessing, even life everlasting. Say, so there's a place of blessing, right? There's a, a, a position for blessing. Psalms 134 says, Oh, praise the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, you who serve at night in the house of the Lord, Lift your hands towards the sanctuary and praise the Lord. May the Lord who made heaven and earth bless you from Jerusalem. So we, we see a principle here. They're singing these songs as they march this kind of dusty track up to the city of Jerusalem. They recognize God has declared this is a place of blessing and I'm going to bless the world through this place. Now, how many of you have ever been to Jerusalem? So how many of you feel like you've totally missed out? 
Number one, you did because the falafel's amazing. Number two, Pastor Steve and I are the only ones that have been. How many of you feel like this is a bummer if this is the place, the only place that God chose to bless? Because we didn't get to go there, right? It's kind of like I feel extremely agitated at every one of you today. Do you want to know why? Because you're getting a Chick-fil-A and we're not. It, 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 I move away from Medford, and now you get a Chick-fil-A. It makes me mad. <laughs> Two of us have been to Jerusalem in this room that raised our hands, and that would be a big bummer if nobody else got to experience God's blessing, if that was the only place that God's blessing dwelt. But that's not the case, because the story has moved on from this time. It's not that that physical location is necessarily the, the, the epicenter of God's blessing. Actually, the epicenter of God's blessing is in his people because the Holy Spirit now dwells in you. In the same way the Holy Spirit inhabited that the inner uh, part of the temple, the, 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 the secret place, the holy place, the holy of holies, now the Holy Spirit dwells in you as a follower of Jesus and you can be a place of blessing. But there are still places of blessing. Maybe not physically, though those are, I'm sure exist as well, but there are specific places of blessing that we can pursue in our life to get underneath or get a part of the blessing of God. How many of you want to get that all over your life today? It's kind of like when you go to Silver Dragon, you're like, pink sauce, get it all over everything. Fried rice, marfar chicken, sweet and sour pork, make it happen. Come on, let that blessing rain down in Jesus' name. You guys are like, he doesn't ever say anything serious. He just makes jokes. I will say some serious things, I promise. All right. I want to tell you today three zones of blessing, three places of blessing that you can position your life for. Again, not earning, not effort, because you don't earn God's blessing, you receive it. But there are three places of blessing, and more than that, but I want to give you three today that you can unlock that tangible reality and see that tangible favor of God in your life. Three blessing zones. Number one is the place of worship. The place of worship. Somebody's going to get blessed. When you understand that God has called you out of darkness. He sent Jesus to die on the cross to redeem and, and ransom you from sin and from darkness. He brought you into relationship with him and, and you were created for this thing that we call worship. Worship isn't just singing songs on a Sunday morning. Worship isn't just listening to music on Spotify and having your daily devotions. Worship is about living in the reality of who God is and what God has done and who he is to you. And it's the enjoyment of that relationship. And when you live your life in honor of God and worship of God, you can worship God in every single thing you do. But what I want to talk about today specifically is the place of blessing as it relates to this place of worship. And so I, what I like to call it is the secret place. And I believe every uh, person here needs to have a secret place. This is your time. It's that place of intimacy and worship with God. It's that place where you are with him and, and there's no secrets and there's no lies and there's no artifice and there's no hypocrisy. You're, you're honest with God and you're worshiping God and you're delighting in God. It's that place that we can go to with God. And it's, a, it's like a well that, that gives water to the rest of your life. I remember when I was a teenager, many, 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 many years ago, uh, I was uh, living at my parents' house, and we lived on Highcrest Drive. Many of you would know about that place where we lived, up on the hill, on, on the uh, foothills of Roxy Ann. And I had a, a room in the basement, and I had somehow procured my parents' stereo system, which was antiquated, but really awesome. It was like amplifiers and tape cassettes and CDs and all this kind of stuff and like a stack of things and these massive wooden speakers that, that were like weighed more than a car. I mean, they were huge and heavy. Remember those? The brown wooden speakers. And I put those in my room and I would lay there on the brown carpet and I would listen to Martin Smith and Delirious, listen to Cutting Edge, that CD, and Deeper and uh, uh, all, uh, King of Fools, that, that CD, and this worship music, I would listen to these songs about the river of God and the passion for God and heart for God, and I would lay there all by myself for, for sometimes even hours, and I would just worship God. I would just burn for God, and I would pray, God, I want to love you more. God, I want to know you more. God, I want to, you to fill me up from the inside out, and there was no agenda. There was nothing. Nobody was coming to, to say, well, because you did that, now you're going to get to do X, Y, Z. That, that wasn't what it was about. It was just about loving God and knowing God. 
And that's the place of worship. Come on, it's the secret place. Now here's what happened is because I spent time in that place doing what I call deepening or digging the well, I was digging a well of worship in my life. And what happened is when you hit that place of worship and all of a sudden the water begins to flow out of your life, you can't hide the anointing and the power and the presence of God because it comes spilling out of you and impacting other people. But you can't fake that. You have to dig that in the secret place. And this is what God wants to do in each and every one of us, is he wants to give us this place of worship, a place where he's chosen to bless us. Come on. You know, we live in an instant microwave society. We're, we're the Amazon Prime society. How many of you feel personally offended when you go to a store and they're like, we don't have what you wanted? If I, if I leave my home, you know, and I decide to like give Walmart the gift of my presence, Hello, do you have the item I'm looking for? No, sir. Sorry, we're going to have to order that in for you. Stop. I feel personally offended because you can order anything online, and now they even have drones that will bring it to you. You know what I mean? How many of you know in like the next 10 years, what I'm praying for is teleportation. I'll be up there in Eugene. I'll be like, you know what I want right now? Grilled Chick-fil-A nuggets. Boop, boop, zoom, and they're here. You know, instant fulfillment. In big cities, they have drones that deliver your Amazon orders. Did you know that? You can order a book and then it'll bring it to you. It's amazing. I don't know if it's for the general public, but we're an instant society. But you know what? The secret place in this place of worship is not about that instantaneous fulfillment. It's about waiting on the Lord and waiting on his timing and waiting on him. When Jesus was getting ready to ascend into heaven, he told his disciples, he said, hey, guys, I want you to go to Jerusalem and I want you to wait for the gift of the Father. I want you to wait for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So they went. It says they were in one accord. It was a very small or a very large Honda. And they were all there. It's a very oversaved joke. They were there in the upper room. They were all together. And they were waiting on the Lord. And then at some point, there came the sound of a rushing mighty wind. And then above their head appeared these tongues of fire. They began to speak with other languages. And boom, the Holy Spirit came in that moment. But it came because they waited on the Lord. And then there was a great, a great revival that took place. But it wasn't because they were out kicking down doors uh, and trying to move God. They were waiting for God to move. And they moved when he moved. God wants to teach us the lost art of waiting. Because what happens is oftentimes our natural movement misses the supernatural blessing or movement of God that we would have received if we'd waited on the Lord. And I'm learning this lesson in my life now because I like to, to do things. I like to move things forward. It's how I'm wired. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a starter. I'm a, a you know, kickstarter even. I want to get stuff going. And the Lord's having to teach us in our life, wait on me. Wait for my provision. Wait for my movement. Wait on the Lord. And this is a place that God will bless us if we will stay and occupy this place of worship. Come on, somebody. We'll occupy this place of worship. We'll stay in love with God. We'll keep that fire fresh and burning bright. And here's what happens. is When you're staying close to the blessing zone, it's like being near Robert when the linguisa is cooking. Come on, you're near him and then the blessing attaches to your life. And it also attaches, in that case, to your hips. It's both, you know, it's a... Massive blessing. The sign of blessing. I'm a very blessed man, right? I got right here. Um, we went to Great Wolf Lodge. Anybody ever been up to the Great Wolf Lodge up in Washington? And uh, the Great Wolf Lodge is this giant indoor uh, splash zone. It's a water slides, water park. And, and on, in, in the Great Wolf Lodge, they have this massive water bucket that hangs over this playground in this water park. And it slowly fills up, and then all of a sudden when it gets too full, it, it turns over and it dumps hundreds of gallons of water in this massive outpouring. And I, what I like to do is watch dry people walk through, not recognizing they are in the splash zone. And then I watch that bucket with glee and delight as it begins to fill and tip, and then all of a sudden grandma gets doused. You know what I mean? <laughs> grandma didn't get run over by a reindeer. She got, in and she got <laughs> deluged with water. But I think about that as a picture of what it means to wait in the secret place with God. Here's the thing. Just be around when the blessing comes down. God is going to pour out his spirit. It says it in the scripture, in the last days I'll pour out my spirit. But I know God pours out his spirit upon anybody that waits upon the Lord. The scripture says that if you wait on the Lord, he's going to renew your strength. You know, there's, 
there's these times when you wait on God, inevitably you will get blessed. Are you with me? So instead of trying to run around and pursue and all this kind of stuff, what if you waited on the Lord in the secret place of worship and you waited for God to pour out his spirit upon your life? But you got to be patient and wait upon him. Just be around when the blessing comes down. God will bless you in the place of worship. Number two, God will bless you in the place of sacrifice. Now I know I say that word and you're like, well, I don't like that word, really. Sacrifice isn't my favorite. We're talking about blessing. Tell me about how God's going to give me a million dollars in a Cadillac. No. <laughs> God chooses to bless the place of sacrifice. You know, everything good in God's kingdom comes from sacrifice. But actually, everything good in life comes from sacrifice, too. Everything that matters, that's important, comes from investment. It's the law of sowing and reaping. The seeds that you plant are the harvest you'll sow or the harvest you'll reap. And so here's the principle. You'll always have need if you never plant seed. And here's where a lot of people miss it with God and in life. Well, I, I would give, but I don't have enough. What you're doing is you're a farmer who's sitting there going, I don't have enough to plant my fields this year. You're a fisherman who's standing on the shore with his nets bone dry, not using them to go into the water and catch fish. Let me give you a theological term for that. Stupid. In Jesus' name. Because the, the, if what you have is not what you need, it's not your harvest, it's your seed. I don't have enough money to give. Then you need to give. You need to sow seed so that God can bless the seed so it can grow a harvest so then you have more than enough so you can do it again. Well, I'm too poor to be a giver. Well, then you'll always be too poor. And that's not, that's not my opinion. That's how the universe works. It's not even just a scriptural principle. It's a universal principle because that's the way the world works. And we get that. We, we actually understand that, that that's true. It, Natalie read this verse today where King David was offered something and he was going to give a sacrifice, going to give an offering to God. And somebody, and Aruna said, well, let me give you the materials. He said, wait a second. I'm not going to give to God something that costs me nothing. Why? Because if it doesn't cost me something, it wasn't a sacrifice. It wasn't an investment. And I won't receive the, 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 the recompense or the reward that comes. I won't, I won't trigger the activity that sacrifice releases. So let me tell you, this is going to upgrade somebody today. This is a counterintuitive truth, but I think this has the power to revolutionize your life. So listen up, and pay attention, and get this. Smart people seek out opportunities to sacrifice. Smart people look for opportunities to sacrifice. Let me prove it to you. In any elite athlete out there that wants to, to, to achieve the heights of what they could do physically, athletes, they actually seek out and celebrate harder workouts. You ever be, get around those types of people that are like, bro, yeah, I was just pumping iron at the gym today and man, I love that pump. You know what I mean? Like Johnny, you know, we're at, we're at camp or whatever and the, we're like just waking up drinking coffee and he's like, yeah, I just ran 20 miles. And that's why I hate him. That's why I have to show a picture of him really fat because I'm <laughs> projecting how I feel around people that are like really fit. And they're like, yeah, I just did a 5K today. You're like, well, I drove 5K today, I think. <laughs> 5K, is that the new order uh, size of nuggets at McDonald's? Yeah, I'm familiar with that. <laughs> But athletes, they seek out and celebrate harder workouts. They, they're like, if, if it'll challenge me at a higher level, at a deeper level, it'll hurt more, then I'll get more out of the other side. Billionaires, rich people, millionaires, they seek out bigger investments. They're not looking for an opportunity to conserve and hoard. They're looking for an opportunity to invest and sow. So when you think about your life, if where you want to go is not where, if you're where you are is, is not where you want to go, you have to sow to go where you want to go. You have to invest. You have to sacrifice. And God chooses to bless this place of sacrifice. God shows up in these moments. People that walk by faith, they seek out opportunities of supernatural sacrifice to give their time, to give their money, to give their, their will, to turn over their life to God and his kingdom, understanding this principle, you can never outgive God. You're not earning God's blessing, but if you position yourself under the, the splash zone at Great Wolf Lodge of God's blessing because of your investment in the place of sacrifice, the more you do that and the longer you stay in that zone, inevitably you will be blessed by God. 
could tell you right now, you know, I remember talking to my dad many times in my life saying, hey, I, there's a cost or a price that I'm considering paying. I remember two years ago, I was getting ready to, I was launching an online business and I, I, I had, there was a man that, that I came across that was a coach and a, 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 a very you know, smart, successful business person and there was an opportunity to invest a large amount of money to get mentorship and coaching. And I, I asked my dad, I said, and I knew what he would say because he, he raised me and taught me how to think, but I said, what do you think about investing? And he said, he didn't really even hesitate. It was like, well, do you think it'll take you to the next level? Yes. Why are you even asking me the question? Do it. Why? Because there's a, there's a principle at work here. If you will invest towards, sacrifice towards where you want to go, it pulls you through into that place. So God will use this to bless you. Smart people are seeking out this place of sacrifice. But here's the thing. Sometimes we, we, we go, okay, well, I'm going to listen to Pastor Jake, and so I'm going to sacrifice. I'm going to sow. I'm going to give. I'm going to start tithing, or I'm going to start giving, or I'm going to start serving, or whatever that may be. And then we get into a place of scarcity. And all of a sudden, in the place of scarcity, we go, well, gosh, uh, this maybe doesn't work. I, I think I missed it. This is, this is wrong. But here's what's happening. Sometimes God positions us or leads us or allows us into a place of scarcity because we're on the journey towards the blessing that he's prepared for us. And you can see this biblically. The, the, the Israelites had to go through the wilderness to get to the promised land. They had to get through that place. And so wise people, this is what they do. When they are sacrificing, when they're investing, when they're serving, when they're giving of themselves, and, the, and they don't experience what they perceive to be God's blessing in the moment, they wait upon the Lord and they say, God, I know that you're using this and that you're leading me towards something. And they turn that place of sacrifice and scarcity into a place of worship, anticipating the supernatural blessing of God, which will come as a matter of principle. Are you with me? So there are times in life when there's contradictory evidence, but I don't immediately turn on God and say, you are false and you're a liar. That's what foolish people do. Wise people wait upon the Lord, understanding I'll never outgive him. If I give to him, if I sacrifice, he's, he's, he's there to bless. Number three, the place of grace. And this is where we're going to wrap it up today. And I, and I think it really is fitting because this is really the root of what it means to be a Christian and a follower of Jesus, the place of grace, which is this, living in full acceptance of the scandalous goodness of the gospel, meaning that we actually believe and live like our sins are forgiven and that we've been made right with God. Listen to what the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Rome. He said, and since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son, while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. This is my favorite verse in the Bible right here. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. Do you know who you need to preach the gospel to every single day? Yourself. Because our wicked and unbelieving hearts don't like to trust that God actually did what he said he would do and that the gospel is true. We need to live and operate as if this scandalous news, this gospel, this truth that Jesus gave his life and paid for every ounce of your sin, past, present, and future, that it was actually effective and that he did it and that you were actually forgiven and that when God looks at you, he doesn't see an enemy, he sees a friend. Because isn't it like us as Christians to live out a weak and neutered version of the gospel? We, we, we go, you know, well, yeah, I know God loves me, but he doesn't like me. I know God wants to bless me, I guess, kind of, and, but really I'm, a, I'm still doing bad things. That I, I've sinned and I've done something wrong this week and Listen to the ludicrous things we say as Christians. I had a good day. I had a bad day. How does a dead or a live person have a good or a bad day? Those are matters of relative uh, 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 meters, right? If you see what I'm saying, it's the speedometer of righteousness. That's not how it works. You either are righteous or you are not righteous. You are either alive or you are dead. There's no middle ground. And yet we tend to look at our salvation as somewhere on a scale degree. And we're making a mistake because what we're looking at is sanctification, that God wants to purify you and actually change your behavior and make you more like Jesus in your living and your doing and your breathing and your eating and your life, right? He wants to help you discover the root for the ducks, not the beavers. He wants to sanctify you in Jesus' name, 
or at least not the Huskies. Where's Glenn? He needs prayer. Yeah, we need to help him. It's our brother in Christ. We need to challenge him with truth, you know, turn him from his wicked ways. But we're mistaking sanctification with justification. Justification is that positionally in Christ, if you've received Jesus, God doesn't look at you as a sinner and he, he sees Jesus. Come on. So we either believe the gospel and live like the gospel is true, which changes everything about us, changes everything about how we live, or we don't. How many of you have ever heard this song? Sing it with me. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. That saved a wretch like me. I once. Come on, sing it like you mean it. I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Come on, let's praise God today. He's singing good. Maybe you walked in here and you're the biggest sinner that Jackson County's ever known, but you know the words of that song. Why? Because it's, it's in our cultural context. Like, there's something amazing about that song. It's called Amazing Grace, and it's an awesome song, isn't it? It doesn't even need, like, a cool hip-hop beat. It's just good. Because the message of that song is so powerful. Did you know the guy that wrote that song, John Newton, was a horrible person? Those words that he wrote saved a wretch. He was a wretch. The guy was so, he was a sailor on a slave ship, okay? Capturing people, putting them into slavery. How many of you think hard pass, right? Nah, bro. You know what I mean? Don't do that. But not only was he a slave ship sailor, he was so foul and profane with his language that the other sailors thought he was over the top. Literally, the other sailors were like, dude, you're too much. What do you have to say and do to be rebuked and rejected by sailors? He was a bad guy. And they actually disliked him so much that they sold him into slavery and his father had to come and get him out of slavery. So John Newton, when he later becomes a Christian, he understands how amazing grace really is. And that's why that song really speaks to us. But I want you to rewrite it how most Christians actually live their life. Pretty decent grace. Fairly nice, the sound. But saved. Pretty good person. Like me. I once was mildly off track. But now, I'm back. <laughs> Didn't see all the way clearly. But now I'm good. You know what I mean? We, we really make it mediocre. But I've never heard a song called Mediocre Grace that ever uh, topped any charts. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. If your grace isn't amazing, it's not grace. And you're not living in the place of grace. And you're not living in light of the gospel. The gospel, every morning we should wake up and be like, what? Oh man, this is awesome. The other day, like we, we watched on Friday as God's holy uh, and called and chosen team, the Oregon Ducks, prevailed over the Utah Utes. Come on, in Jesus' name. <clears throat> and I was cheering and yelling, and Dad and I, we were being, you know, censored by Natalie because she wanted us to, like, be with my mom at her birthday party. But, you know, so we, we, but we were down there. We were, we were cheering, and we were excited. And then the next morning, I woke up, and I was like, yes, we are still the champions. Come on. It was still true today. Like, it felt like a dream. I'm so excited. Hey, Josh, what bowl is USC in? Oh, the cheese it Bowl. Okay, anyways, I'm um, sorry. I woke up and I was, uh, I love you. I woke up and I was so excited. You know, we should feel this way about the gospel. That's so amazing. Every day we should wake up and go, man, I can't believe it. This is incredible. This is incredible. Everything I get to do today gets to happen in light of the fact that I'm forgiven, and that Jesus took my sins away. I was a wretch, I was blind, but now I see. Come on, I was lost, but now I'm found. That's the grace, the place of grace, and it's when you live in that, it changes everything, and it's a place that God chooses to bless. And when you live in grace, it takes you back to that place of sacrifice, and it's a joy to serve and to sacrifice and to give. It takes you back to the place of worship and it's a joy to know God and to, to live with God and to have a relationship with him. But it comes from this deep-rooted place 
of grace, this understanding that the gospel is true, not just for other people, but for you. And you can live in that place and it brings God's blessing down in your life. Amen? Amen. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes this morning. Hey, I know every single week at church, people come looking for hope, looking for life, looking for answers. And maybe you didn't come here looking for uh, anything specific. You just know that you need something in your life. But I don't believe anybody's brought here or comes here by accident. Maybe somebody invited you or you saw an ad on TV or a Facebook ad or something or a website, but that's the mechanism that brought you here. But actually God brought you here today because he wanted you to hear the good news that he loves you so much that he sent Jesus to die on the cross for your sins. He paid for those sins. And if you will put your faith and trust in him and start that journey of following him today, he's gonna open up everything to you, bring you into his family, forgive you, and, and, and give you that place at his table. Fill your life with good things. He's gonna, he's gonna save you today. So if that's you and you're like, Pastor Jake, I want that. I don't know all the theology. I don't know all the songs. I don't even know all the verses of Amazing Grace. I, I don't deserve it, I, I, but I want to know God. I want to be saved. This is your moment today to put your faith and trust in Jesus. Would you just lift your hand where I can see? Anybody in this place, I wanna put my faith and trust in Jesus today. I want to put my faith and trust in Jesus today. Let's all pray this prayer together. Dear Jesus, I put my faith and trust in you. And in you alone, I give you my life and I receive your life. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins and paying my bill in full. You are my Lord and Savior. And I give you my life today. In Jesus' name, amen.